Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Simone Farrazin, and together with my partner Andrea Trimarchi, we are the founders of a design office here in Milan and in Rotterdam called Forma Fantasma. But we are also the curators of this edition of Prada Frames. Me and Andrea, we have been practicing in the field of design since 2009 and have always been interested in the ethical implication that the act of design entails. In light of this interest and in constant conversation with Prada, with whom we share common interests in the dissemination of knowledge and in education, we put together this symposium. In fact, before moving um, ahead with the explanation on the content of Prada Frames, I would like to thank a person who supported the project since the beginning and trusted us in this process, and this person is Mrs. Prada. Prada Frames is a symposium that investigates the complex relationship between the environment and design outcomes. Most probably many of you are here today because of the Furniture Fair in Milan. What better occasion could there be to gather here to discuss about the many possibilities, but also the problematics of doing design today? We believe it is crucial to acknowledge the legacy of industrial production as a fundamental source for the expertise and agency of the designer while also addressing its historic contribution to environmental instability. This symposium brings together designers, architects, curators, producers, but also scientists, anthropologists, activists, and legal and economic experts. The transdisciplinary nature of the symposium, it is not only a way to increase the scale and the depth of the research, but it is also an ethical position, one that recognizes the expertise, the lived experience of practitioners that works in the fields beyond design. Considering the fact that product frames running in parallel to the furniture fair, we thought it was pertinent, I would say almost obvious, to talk about the forest, the uh, governance of the timber industry, but also to look at forests not only as a site of extraction, but also as a place inhabited by a multi uh, species, um, multiplicity of species, both human and more than humans. Today, the ever-increasing consumption of wooden products makes the timber industry one of the largest globally and among the most impactful in our everyday lives. Many of our furniture, clothing, packaging, fuels, and fertilizers are sourced from some of the world's most complex ecosystems. In three days, this is the last one, of course, and with two sessions per day, this symposium will also extend beyond the subject of the forest to focus on the work of practitioners that have an expansive idea of the design discipline and the many ways uh, human activities intersect the natural environment. Of course, we are here not only because this location is perfect because it's wonderful. We are here because if you think about, we are within a forest made of uh, walnut trees, made of paper pulp for books, made in the form of chairs uh, where you're sitting on. But the Bredain State is also a great location because it is a place where knowledge is conserved, where knowledge is, is shared, and, and so it is pertinent, pertinent for the symposium. As an extension of this thought, uh, together with uh, the creators of Bredain uh, a selection of books, uh, all related to the vegetal world, are present in the vitrines and the entrance, and if you haven't seen these books, I invite you to do so on your way out. And I would also like to um, address and to thank the uh, Biblioteca di Pavia, who gave us the permission to film the wonderful uh, publication that you spotted most probably coming in, which is an archive of wooden specimen from the region of Lombardy, done at the end of the 18th century. With no further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the day. The speaker is Stefano Boeri, who needs no introduction. We are here in his city, and his work has been a great inspiration for a generation of designers and architects in his everlasting understanding and attention to ecology and design. Stefano is an architect, an urban planner, and full professor at Politecnico di Milano. At the forefront of the debate on climate change in the field of international architecture, Stefano Boeri's work keeps a constant focus on the geopolitical and environmental implication of urban phenomena. He is also the president of Triennale Milan, and President of Forestami Scientific Committee. Welcome, Stefano. <laughs> so 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Simone. Um, well, uh, I think it's important to consider our relation with forest, with trees, with plants. And, uh, and I, my, my dear friend, Stefano Mancuso, who is a neurobiologist, often tells me, well, we have to be aware of our plant blindness. Uh, I believe it's more about a more a serious oblivion of what is our relation with the world of uh, trees. Just what's that? Compresses the local history of the universe into a single year. If the universe began on January 1st, it was not until May that the Milky Way formed. Other planetary systems may have appeared in June, July, and August, but our sun and Earth not until mid-September. Life arose soon after. Everything humans have ever done occurred in that bright speck at the lower right of the cosmic calendar. This is Carl Sagan, the astronomer, 1977, and uh, he tells us how, well, uh, our, our life is uh, so short and so, let's say, incomparable with uh, the life of plants. And this is one of the way we, let's say, we are aware and should be aware of our oblivion. Uh, but this is not the only way to consider that. This is Colin Touch. He's a, an, amazing, an amazing biologist. And uh, in 2003, he's talking about uh, how plants are contributing to the life of all the living species of the planet. So we know how the photosynthesis is working, putting together uh, the light from the sun and the water from the ground, and creating oxygen, keeping carbon, and at the same time uh, producing all the elements that are necessary for our life. So I think when we have to, to talk about uh, uh, this uh, oblivion, we immediately have to deal with two main aporias, just to use uh, old but very important Greek concept. The first aporia is about our relation with forest. So we, we know that if we could concentrate all what we could consider city, what we could consider an urban condition in one unique segment of the planet, well, we will not cover more than the 3-4% of the surface of the emerging lands of our planet. Uh, this urban Pangea, uh, well, uh, it's uh, contributing uh, in many ways to, to the life of the planet, but at the same time, it's consuming the 70% of the natural resources and producing the 75%, 80% in the recent years of the CO2, which is present in the atmosphere. And we know well how this presence is the region of global warming and, and climate change. Uh, but the first aporia is that uh, thanks to this very, very, let's say, circumscribed and short presence, we are in condition to control, to, let's say, to, to realize a kind of technosphere that is managing to control the entire, the entire planet. Uh, the forests that are present basically in the 30% of the surface of uh, our planet have a completely different role. Uh, they are absorbing the CO2 that we have already produced together with the ocean, and they are contributing to the life uh, of our species. So I think that in this, let's say, contradiction, in this, uh, let's say, I know maybe we can really start to, con to talk about what we have done. Some years ago, together with uh, Triennale and, and Mom and Paolo Antonelli, we have opened an exhibition called Broken Nature, where we're discussing how we could try to fix, to repair the disasters that we have done in terms of deforestation, in terms of colonization of, uh, of uh, let's say, of the living species realm that are not done by cities. And, uh, and uh, we try to start to go back to some example. This is something that uh, I did personally with Andrea Branzi. It was an idea of 2008 for, for Paris, for the big Paris. 
And what we were proposing with Andrea was to make, to help the wild animals to come back, to live, to stay, it was a provocation center of Paris. And some years after, together with the students at Polytechnic, we started to imagine how we could establish a relation with the other living species that cohabit with us in our urban environment. And it uh, was, uh, was amazing how every student was trying to assume the point of view, the perspective of one species, and thanks to that, consider the cycle of life, the daily cycle of life, and how there are possible contradictions, conflicts, cohabitation models with the other species in our urban environment. And that was an amazing way to start to work on the concept of anthropocentrism. And uh, I think that nobody more, nobody better than Emanuele Koccia, who is a very good friend of us, has understood and has explained to us how, and that's a second aporia, we really should do what we can do in order to, let's say, abandon the arrogance of, uh, the, let's say, a, a, a call a anthropocentrist, we want to stay on the pedestal of life. But at the same time, if we try seriously to develop our empathy for other living species, if you try seriously to, let's say, acquire the point of view of the other species, we are confirming our power. We are confirming our anthropocentrism. That's the reason we have to work in the direction of a new anthropocentrism and not to abandon our responsibility on the life of the planet. Probably this is a, the direction that we should acquire in the future. Ms. Jan Jan Goodall. I have this very strong understanding of the interconnectedness of all the life forms. And how each little species has a role to play. And for me, it's the most wonderful place to be. You know, we're part of a natural world and we rely on it. And we especially rely on forests. Clean air and clean water and biodiversity and so many different aspects. <coughs> A lot of people have a connection to trees. The environment is in such a, a dire situation that we need to help it along. To me, it's just absolutely obvious we need to plant now. Um. That's the reason we uh, started to work with Jen, with other, let's say, thinkers and uh, activists from all over the world, trying to, let's say, to make our obsession for green uh, more and more pragmatically active. And uh, for that reason, also, we enter in contact with uh, many other, let's say, uh, activists and thinkers. One of them is uh, Davi Kopenawa from Yononami Population in, uh, in the Amazonic Forest. And uh, with them, we have started, also thanks to the Triennale exhibition we had done two years ago, to work trying to see how it's possible to redefine a, the concept of cohabitation between the human sphere and the natural sphere. And how to define it, considering that what we have understood after the pandemic is that we are not separated by, from nature. That this kind of dualism, from culture and nature, from human and non-human, it's absolutely, absolutely absurd. Since we have understood that the natural microorganism who was inside us has changed the life of all of us in few weeks. Uh, but what we do in our profession is, is different. Uh, we try to work on this idea of connectivity, uh, but being architects, being urban planners, that means considering with attention what we have done, considering with attention the oblivion we have lopped in these uh, centuries in relation with living nature. And the first issue for us is about architecture. So we have many inspiration, we have, it's so complicated to say we're out of the base of all that, but for sure this is one of the 
reference, the main reference, the brown trees of Italo Calvino. And another main reference is him. In dieser Zeit, in der wir über diese ganzen Fragen der Wieder, der Lebendigung von Lebenslinien in der Natur, die ja durch die allgemeine Zerstörung unmenschlichen Wirtschaftens in Gefahr ist, dass zu dieser Zeit Menschen alle sich aufgemacht haben und einmal die Richtung umgedreht haben. So what Joseph Boy has done in Kassel in 1981, transforming 9,000 basalt stone in 9,000 oak trees and changing, materially transforming the nature of the city was so important for all of us. And what we try to do is to combine living nature with architecture, not considering trees, plants, natural vegetable subjects as decorations or ornamental, but considering them as a basic component of, uh, of what we do, the basic component of uh, a new kind of cohabitation, a new kind of uh, connectivity. Uh, so you know this is a first experiment. Now we are uh, working in many different parts of the world and uh, uh, trying to improve uh, what we have done. And that's probably one of the last example of our effort, of our attempts. We learn also from our mistakes. That's a, a vertical forest we have realized in Eindhoven, Holland, which is in social housing. So it's really affordable for everybody and it's uh, inhabited by a bunch of young students. And uh, it's so great to see how, from our perspective, this idea of, uh, of a house for trees and birds that host also humans can become something that has to be totally affordable for everybody. But uh, another scale, another dimension of our work is about forestation. Since many years we work with FAO and other international subjects to promote for urban forestation, to increase the vegetal surfaces in our cities because it's there where the CO2 is produced that we have to, let's say, uh, fight in the enemy in its field, improve and implement the presence of forests on woodlands. They clean the air, they reduce the heat, uh, they, they uh, absorb CO2, they produce oxygen, and they help us also to defend our health. Uh, but at the same time, we are working also in uh, trying to, let's say, make cities greener. And in some parts of the world, like China, we are proposing a model. Uh, in China, every year, 14 million of people are abandoning the countryside. And uh, so it, we cannot avoid to imagine how to build new cities. And so we are working, trying to show how it's possible to imagine cities that start from the beginning being forest cities, and not simply, and not simply uh, mineral city as happens uh, always. This is another proposal for, for Mexico. Uh, but uh, at the larger scale, uh, I think this is uh, what we should do. This is uh, uh, Richard Weller. Uh, Richard Weller is a, a, a ethologist, biologist, and urban planner, and um, he's teaching at Penn. And uh, his idea of, uh, let's say, a war park is, in my opinion, extremely important because it's very simple. What he says is we have different system of biodiversity hotspots. If we could connect them, we could, when in condition to multiply the advantages of uh, this single uh, hotspot. Just gaze to Italy, how Italy is uh, in itself in all spots of biodiversity. So we are also working on that. We were at the Forum of Climate Change in New York by the United Nations in 2019. And together with FAO, with uh, Kew Gardens and other institutions, we were promoting an idea of uh, realizing a biodiversity corridor on South Europe, was crossing Italy, crossing other countries in order to put in connection the oasis of biodiversity, the natural parts, the regional parts, the maritime parts that we still have. Well, just uh, a few comments. Uh, it's uh, just a few words about uh, something that uh, sometimes happens in our profession. So sometimes you have the opportunity to, let's say, put together all what you're doing uh, in one unique uh, action. Uh, well, uh, two years ago, three years ago, I was asked by the director of the Greek theater in Syracuse, uh, to design the scenography for 
the, for the tri Trojans of uh, Euripides. You know, Euripides wrote the tragedies uh, in uh, 415 before Christ, and the Trojans is uh, still a Mesian contemporary text. He's talking about war and uh, trying to, to show how war has no winners, basically. And uh, uh, so uh, during the Peloponnesian War, uh, Euripides was writing the Trojans, but uh, Jean Paul Sartre in 1977 was rewriting, reinterpreting the Trojans as putting it in connection with the Algerian War. It's French was done in that very moment. So uh, instead of doing a scenography, we have the opportunity to put together all our, let's say, uh, perspective on, on the relation between human sphere and natural sphere. And I'm just showing you the result of what we have done. <laughs> Στα μαύρα μάτια μου να ακούσει τη λαλιά μου. Να δει τα μαύρα μάτια μου να ακούσει τη λαλιά μου. Έψεσαι μου στα λόνι σου και Και γεμό 
σε μαράζει η φωλιά Στο ρομανίσι καρτερό και χτύπα μου να ανοίξω Δεν έχω άλλη υπομονή, εστέρεψη η καρδιά μου Thank you, Stefano, for your important presentation. I'm Andrea Trimarchi, and I'm a co-founder of Forma Fantasma and uh, curator of this first edition of Prada Frames. In line with some of the complexity that you uh, raised, Stefano, we will now have a conversation about the governance of a natural ecosystem and the criticality of carbon offsetting. 
For this matter, I would like to invite Philip Patberg to join me on stage, but we also welcome Nicolas Caschiala, who is joining us online. Philip is a sustainability scientist focusing on the institutional complexity between climate change, biodiversity, ocean, and energy governance. Philip is the head of the Department of Environmental Policy Analysis at Institutional, uh, Institute of Environmental Studies and is director of the Amsterdam Sustainability Institute at the Free University in Amsterdam. Niklas is Chief Impact Officer at Compensate, a practice fighting climate change by offering easy access to top tier carbon projects. Cascala oversees Compensate sustainability approach, carbon capture portfolio, and advocacy effort to reform the voluntary carbon market. Cascala is also the founder of Protect Our Winters Finland and has extensive experience in environmental NGOs. Thank you, everybody, and Simone will join Philip and Niklas on stage. Thank you. Thank there. you. Hello. Hi, Niklas. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. Hello, everyone. Fantastic. So uh, if you don't mind, I think it's best if I start with some questions to Philip, and then, Niklas, if you bear with us, I will then have a conversation with, uh, with you. Um, so today, essentially, we are going to talk about governance and economy, and how these two possible uh, different approaches can provide, um, we hope, solutions. Let's see if that's possible for the climate crisis. And Philippe, I would like to start uh, first uh, with you. Um, how do you think it is possible to develop governance in the light of the climate crisis? And what are the basic challenges to do so when we talk very often about entities which are transnational by, nat by nature? So seas and, of course, forests, since we're talking about forests. Thank you. Uh, and it's really good to be here. So uh, let me start with saying uh, thank you to Forma Fantasma and also to Prada for getting us here. And I just want to congratulate you on just the idea to put different people in a room from very different perspectives and disciplines, because that's basically already the answer. If we want to try to tackle those problems that are complex, then we need to step out of our comfort zones and stop being a scientist or an architect or a designer or an economist and come together and try to really focus on solving those uh, pressing problems. Um, having that said, it's not that easy, actually, many people try that, so being on a panel like this is not the solution, it's just one very tiny step. Uh, I do enjoy it nonetheless to, to be here. Let me just um, focus a bit on the image which is behind me. Um, it's just a random satellite image that shows the, the, the story that has been told many times, how an intact forest ecosystem uh, basically transforms into one that is fragmented and scattered due to our human influence. And the really important observation is that most of deforestation that we see globally occurring isn't illegal. It is actually fully in line with laws, which means that actually the laws we have help us to do this, which begs the question, if that's actually totally legal, if, if it's meant to be like this, then maybe the problem is much more fundamental. So to turn that around, I think if you ask you know, what is it that is underlying this and what could we do? We have a very pervasive ideology underlining everything we do. And you could say it's expansionism. We need to do more. We need to get better. We need to be faster. And we have to innovate, which means all the same, all the time. And while that is a driving force of humans, it also creates a lot of those problems. And we need to get out of that mindset. Now, some of the things we've seen in the last 30 years in terms of how we govern forests have tried to do that, but unfortunately, unsuccessfully so. So one of the early ideas was, well, if governments don't protect the forest, let us do that ourselves. So some NGOs, some human rights organizations, and some producers, some, some forest managers came together in the early 1990s to develop a, a label for timber, uh, which was one of the first globally known eco-labels, the Forest Stewardship Council. So when you buy, timber products from toilet paper to your writing paper, but also furniture, there's a high likelihood it bears that label. And in the beginning, everyone was very enthusiastic about that. Why? Because basically, if the states don't protect the forest, then we do it ourselves. And it works, let me say, on paper, because when you see the, the gross rates of labels all over the place, I think there are 700 eco-labels in the market, it is a fantastic success story. But the flip side is, it's also a lot of window dressing. It's also a lot of greenwashing, because the, the basic problem is that the consumer thinks, well, as long as I buy stuff with a label, 
it's okay to buy. So let's buy some more. And actually some of the labels have been shown to induce more consumerism. So we are at a crossroads today where we have explored some of those instruments that do work to some extent, but we haven't asked the fundamental problem of how can we get out of this expansionist mindset. And I think that's a very difficult one. I do not know the answer, and that's why, again, I think we need to come together to discuss that. So for me, the glass is a bit half empty and half full. Yeah. We know that some things work. We, we can put labels on stuff, and we can also make better forest laws, yeah. but it will not get us out of this mindset. Just one figure, last year, in my home country of Germany, we returned 280 million parcels just because we thought, well, I don't like what's inside, so I get it back, right? All these parcels are made of timber, basically, it's paper yeah, pulp. Of course. And we take that as an innovation that this is the way our economy should run. You know, order something, get it instantly, instant gratification all the time, requires lots of resources. I'm personally not convinced that you can address that problem with any of the, the tools we have discussed so far. So that's why I'm a bit... Uh, Comforting. Yes, okay, so. There is something else also that I thought it was interesting because you said the national states could not handle that, right. which I think, uh, I think it is also interesting to question why is it that? Mm. And I think one of the reasons is also because there are tensions between different politics in different states. Yeah. And where forests are transnational, of course states are not. And of course there's different, different interests which are creating, creating problems. But I think in a conversation we had recently, we also talked about how uh, there is a tendency of fragment narratives, uh, which I always think that when you fragment narratives, you end up fragmenting also responsibilities. Yeah. So, and I'm referring specifically, for instance, the tension between in governance, when you look at a force and you need to create governmental or governance tools, you uh, start to divide in subsections the forest. It is either biodiversity, it is either uh, you know, carbon emissions and so on, or intake. Can you elaborate on this struggle to create governance and, and what can we do to, to, or what can you do since you work in governance to improve that? Great, very challenging question. And um, I, I brought, yeah, I brought a, another visualization. So one of the reasons why we as humans are so successful is division of labor. We don't do all the things that we need to do ourselves. So we have cut everything in little silos, which is tremendously effective. That's why we have ministries for everything, we have bureaucracies for everything, and it works fantastically great. Until the point where we realize that actually we often look in the wrong place. So what is a forest for you? Most people think about an individual tree probably first, and then they realize, well, there are lots of trees, right? But very few people think about trees or forests as all the stuff below, right? All the rhizomatic structures that we have. And once you do that, you understand that we have a very biased perception of reality, in fact. And the same is true for politics, right? So when you think about deforestation and you see these images of the satellite, are we talking about deforestation as the problem? Is this actually climate change? Because by cutting down those forests, you will emit carbon. But you could also say, no, it's actually an opportunity to plant new trees. So what you see here is actually an opportunity for offsetting, for carbon capture and storage. Or is the story of these images actually a story of consumption? Because probably these would be soy fields that we use to feed European cattle um, and produce meat. So is it about you and me and what we had for breakfast? Mm -hmm. So when looking at that, there are many different answers to the problem. And you're absolutely right. If we ask the wrong question, we will get the wrong answers. And what is, what is the solution? The solution is to try to connect. So of course, if you have fragmentation, then the remedy is integration. And integration means we need all the UN agencies to talk together. And you would think, oh, they do. They all sit in you know, Geneva or New York, and they, they sit together and talk all the time. No, they don't. Unfortunately, they don't. They have all these turf wars going on as any bureaucracy, and they say, no, this is part of what we do. No, this is part of what we do. And so they spend most of the time trying to make sure that everyone has a nice portfolio. And the same goes for what we do as scientists. Oh, I'm a political scientist, so I do politics. And then my economist colleague says, yeah, you shouldn't do economics because you don't know anything about that, which is probably true, but I could learn, right? So we stay in our comfort zones, and we need to get out because the reality is, of course, neither. It's neither what's below, neither what's above. It's both of those things, because only when you put them together, you have a tree in a forest. And the same goes for these problems and the answers. We need to be more holistic. And the way to do that is to start rethinking 
how we organize policy making and decision making. Yeah, fantastic. I have one just uh, very brief question. Uh, as you probably know, because we worked together before, but I'm really interested in the idea of granting rights to non-humans. And there was a book in the 70s which was particularly effective, which was called Should Trees Have a Standing? So mm -hmm. it started to prompt this idea of granting rights to non-humans. I would like to know from you if you think this is an interesting well, solution, I would say, or an interesting tool, I would say, or what could be the possible pitfalls. And uh, lastly, what is the role of education in this, since you are also involved in education at the Free University in Amsterdam? Right. Great. Thanks. This is, this is a great question. And sort of uh, personally, I'm very enthusiastic about that idea. I think it's a, it's a challenging idea in terms of moral philosophy to, to say, how could we extend the moral universe? And, and that's actually part of the human, the, the human uh, journey, is, is to do that, to realize that there, there is more than just the tribe or the yeah. family or, or, or your gender or your race. And there's more than just your species. But on the other hand, uh, just speaking as a policy sort of analyst and practitioner, um, we have tried the rights-based approach with many problems, right? So, I mean, racism is something that we try to argue is against human rights. It doesn't mean there isn't any racism. Animal rights are the same. So, using a rights-based approach is powerful as a communicative tool, but is weak if you don't have the tools to enforce it and if, mm -hmm. if the society realities are different. So I would be, as, as a practical person, say, we need all hands on deck. That could be one strategy, that would be one way to do it, but I wouldn't think it is just the solution to say, oh, by of tomorrow all the trees have standing and that now we solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, in terms of education, I do see your point here. We have for a long time made a big mistake uh, and, and that is to think that just because we wrote a book about something or published an article, people now will just change the world. But it needs to trickle down to practice. So if you talk about the next generation of designers to try to fix those problems, then you actually talk about people in 20, 30 years because yeah. we still teach most people the stuff of the 1980s and 1990s, yeah. which isn't a good idea, by the way. So, so this is a self-criticism. I think many institutions of education have failed and are still failing because we rely on what worked in the past, how we teach our students, what programs they go through, what diplomas they get, because we have a very old-fashioned idea what they will do in the workplace of the future. And, and just to paint that picture very drastically for you, you know we're in a climate emergency. If we don't radically turn around, then in 20, 30 years, I mean, there's not any job that will be as today because we are in a crisis situation of unprecedented, uh, unprecedented scope. So then what do we teach students actually for that future? And I think their universities need to really do their homework fast. And, and teaching something like um, having standing for trees would be one small but probably important part of turning around the curriculum. Thank you, Philip. I think it's great that you pointed out so many different things we have to improve. It's still usual to have a checklist. No, no, of course. <laughs> uh, Niklas, uh, thank you for uh, waiting. Um, with you instead, we are looking more at how economy is approaching uh, climatic problems. And as you know, I'm also critical with the idea of carbon offsetting. Uh, and as much as you are too, even if you are developing projects related to, to that, I would like, first of all, if you can give a short introduction to the public on the concept of carbon offsetting for people that might not know that. Sure, thanks and, and hello everyone. Thanks for inviting me and greetings from Helsinki, Finland. Um, to put it bluntly, carbon offsetting, when done badly, it's just a form of pure greenwashing. Uh, and there's a lot of it around, I have to say. Uh, but if it's done well, it can be a very useful tool to take responsibility for emissions that we all of us are still causing. Um, if you think about it, like what, what is causing climate change? It's the fact that we have carbon in the wrong place. We have it in the atmosphere instead of stored somewhere else where it can't cause damage. And we need to learn to do two things at the same time now as humanity. We need to radically reduce emissions, but we also need to remove excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, if you would imagine the atmosphere as a bathtub and carbon dioxide as the water in the bathtub, as humanity, we've had the tap on for centuries or decades, and the water level is already so high that it's overflowing. It's overflowing the edges of the bathtub and causing all kinds of harm. Uh, for now, our solution to climate change has been to turn that top 
tap slightly, uh, uh, turn it off, or not even completely turn it off, keep the water still running. Now, obviously we need to turn the tap off completely. We need to get to zero emissions, but even that won't be enough because the water will still stay at dangerously high levels. So what we also need to do is take the plug out of, from the bottom of the bathtub and drain out the excess water. That's exactly what we need to do with the uh, atmosphere as well. We surpassed safe levels of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere in 1987. Um, it's quite many years since that, and we're still adding CO2 into the atmosphere every day. So we need mechanisms to take responsibility for the CO2 pollution that we're com uh, continuing to do all the time. Um, if we're allowed to pollute, if I'm allowed to pollute, shouldn't I be responsible also for cleaning up after myself? So if offsetting is done correctly, and, and it's not a substitute to emission reductions, but it's something that comes on top of them, it can be a useful tool to take responsibility for those emissions that we're still causing every day, each and every one of us, all the time, unfortunately. Niklas, so let's give a, a simple example. Since we're talking about forests in this symposium, a one way of doing carbon offsetting uh, often is to, to, very, to simplify the concept very, um, very shortly. We, let's say, I, am, I have a, you know, a company here, I emit emissions, and then I decide to, through the help of uh, an agency, to plant trees somewhere in the world to intake the CO2 that I emitted. Um, first of all, I'm very critical with this concept because I believe it can become a form of neocolonialism. Um, and the second uh, thing that I'm worrying is who is actually checking those trees grows up and then that are controlled enough to make sure that they actually reabsorb in maybe 80 years those emissions that, ha that I'm doing right now in this moment in this part of the world. So uh, because I know you're working with, uh, you know, Compensate, I'm thinking, can you give us examples of uh, projects you still believe in, in any case are effective and they are responsible also avoiding the problems that I just mentioned? Sure, I'll, I'll, and, and you're very justified to be worried about uh, what would be called carbon colonialism. I think there's actually, it's not something that you're, you should just be worried about, it's already happening. So um, us, the wealthy people of the world in the global north are continuing our polluting lifestyles and then trying to use projects that are usually in the global south that would then store or sequester the carbon uh, that we have emitted. Is that justified or not? That's a very, very uh, good question. Uh, at Compensate, we're a Finnish organization that's trying to challenge the way this voluntary carbon market has, is, is, is functioning. Um, right now, it's not very, it, it has some fundamental flaws. There are thousands of projects out there in the world that either protect existing forests or maybe plant new trees or use other types of biomass to sequester and store carbon. And it's a very unregulated market at the moment. Uh, but what, we, what we've done is we work together with climate and forest scientists to create a criteria in order to evaluate these projects that are out there. There are some voluntary standards on the market uh, that uh, try to become, be some sort of quality assurance of, or, or, or uh, um, that, that these projects are doing what they're doing. But we've evaluated over 170 of the mo like most well-known and well-established projects in the world. And we've seen that nine out of 10 do not pass our scientific uh, evaluation process. So nine out of 10 of the projects that are selling carbon credits for offset purposes that are these nature-based projects, they don't actually achieve uh, the climate impact that they claim to achieve. So I think, you know, uh, basically um, existing standards are not enough. You need to build other types of, of, of risk mitigation tools, buffers, assurances to make sure that you're actually offsetting your emissions and that it's just not just done on paper. So I would be, you know, if I would uh, were to advise someone who wants to offset their emissions is to be very critical about the projects that are being used, ask some very critical questions from the offset providers. And, and yeah, well, and first of all, obviously always avoid emissions like primarily and only offset those emissions that you completely can avoid. To give you a concrete example, uh, you invited me to come to Milan. That would have uh, cost almost one ton of CO2 emissions. Me flying back and forth to Milan for a half an hour panel. I decided not to come because that would have, you know, 
burn about one third of my annual carbon budget um, if, if I want to remain at, uh, at that globally sustainable levels. So again, I'm very grateful that I'm able to attend through, uh, through this video link because that saved about one ton of emissions and about one third of my annual emissions. So that's again an example of what we need to do. We can never rely on offsetting to be the primary tool as individuals or as companies, but it's always the last tool. But it's also a necessary tool because without, like again, if I have the right to pollute or, and cause emissions that are already causing vast harm around the world, shouldn't the least thing, uh, I sh shouldn't I also be then responsible for cleaning up after myself? Thank you, Niklas, for, for this and also for pointing out that you decided to stay in Helsinki and joining online, which we were very happy also of your decision, and Philip joining us by train. Uh, I want to say something else also. Uh, I mean, um, are there, because I think you mentioned very quickly something that for me is very relevant, and it's, you said there are different ways you can sort of, it's not exactly offsetting carbon, but it has to do also with forest protection. And I have a very simple question. If one problem that we pointed out is that we don't actually know where these trees are planted and how they are managed and so on, uh, are there European-based projects regarding afforestation and carbon offsetting? And if not, uh, why is it that? And what can be done, you know, l sort of, let's say, locally for the public that is here in Europe in this moment, of course? Sure, very good question. And, and this might get slightly technical. But try to, uh, We're to not afraid of me. that. Please go technical. <laughs> so one of the reasons why many of the projects, these carbon projects, are in the global south is related to the way international climate uh, negotiations and, and the sort of architecture of, of climate policy globally has been set up. So originally, the carbon markets started off as compliance markets where governments and, and, and national uh, countries were able to use carbon credits or the countries in the, in the global north were able to use carbon credits that were generated in the global south and thus they were able to, to kind of offset some of their emissions then later on the voluntary carbon market uh, developed and this is where like individuals and companies now use the market to offset their emissions and that's why like this historical fact is one of the reasons why uh, projects are in the global south also another reason is that they are, are, are like maybe easier to scale there then there is another issue which relates to the uh, global carbon accounting under different climate treaties, especially the Paris Agreement. Uh, and this has caused that, like, I mean, there are projects in Europe, there are afforestation, reforestation projects in North Europe, but most projects in the land use sector, the, the carbon that they store is already accounted for in national carbon inventories of the host country. So like, in, for example, in Finland, the government of Finland already takes credit for that carbon that's stored in the forests in order, uh, for it to achieve its uh, carbon neutrality goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2035. Now, if this carbon uh, um, that's sequestered by a forest in Finland would be used by a company to offset their emissions, what would happen is that two entities would try to claim the same carbon, the ownership of the same carbon, and this causes a double accounting or double counting uh, problem. Basically, you can't have two entities trying to claim the same carbon. If you do that, you'll remain with one of the, like one of the entities emissions will still remain in the atmosphere and the others might be sequestered by the forest. So obviously it, for, it has a cl big climate integrity issue. Uh, but this is, uh, most countries in the global south have been able to avoid this uh, situation thus far because of certain stages in, in the Paris Agreement. But now this is becoming an issue also for them. So we need globally, and this comes back to the governance issue, uh, we, we need a mechanism for carbon accounting also for the voluntary carbon market so that we don't have both companies and private organizations and national governments trying to claim the same carbon capture and sequestration, basically. I'm sorry if that went a bit nerdy and technical, no, but, but it's, uh, it's great. Philippe, I tried my best. You... Yes, sorry, I probably mess up the... Uh, the no, no, it's great. But if I could just come in, I think it's fantastic what, what you explained. So this is a great and really important example of the deeper problem, so that we manipulate, as you have explained, the book, so to speak, in this whole game is, of course, a result of political will. There are certain political actors, captured governments, strong interests that actually want to make the system work and not, are not interested in the integrity of the system, but try to basically let it go so it looks like we're doing something, but you can continue that, you, that we do what we do, and that is just a myth. So it's really important to understand that it's not by chance that we do have 
basically loopholes all around and that governments cannot agree on strong accounting rules, although they discussed that for a long time. Uh, Article 6 uh, of the Paris Agreement was the last thing that was negotiated uh, of all the details and just shows how, how much political unwillingness there is. So we need to go back to that fundamental question. Why are governments all around the world failing us as citizens? Because they know, as well as you and I do, they can read the IPCC reports and all the other reports. They know that what we are doing is absolutely unsustainable. So we need to go back and ask that question. Why aren't we moving ahead? And, and one of the problems is indeed that no one oversees the system, right? Because there's all these silos. So we talk about offsetting in Europe, and then we know there's no space for that because we also need to grow our own food because in the Ukraine there's a war, and we have to make our own biofuels because we can use ru Russian gas, and we want to offset, and we want to expand cities because we're more people. How are you going to do that? No one tells you. The only thing they tell you is, ah, it's going to be fine because no one can connect the trees. And that's how we all keep discussing that over and over again, and we're not getting deeper to the solution. Philip, Niklas, thank you very much for this panel. I mean, we could have stayed here much we longer. Should, but we, we can, yeah. I know. But uh, right. still, I thought it was a great introduction right. to both perspectives. Thank you. And Thanks. I want to leave the stage. I would like to leave the stage now to Beatrice Leanza, who will moderate the next uh, panel with Paolo Tavares. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Beatrice Leanza. Pleasure to be here for second set. Um, I really want to applaud what you, as Andrea and Simone, have done with this curation because in light of what you have just heard this morning, I think everything that Paolo has to share with you will resonate tremendously. So, you know, brace yourself. Um, and it's an immense pleasure, really. So I'll moderate a conversation with Paolo after his short introduction, presentation, so we know where we are. Uh, and then we have um, a few minutes for Q&A, so prepare your burning questions. Um, let me just introduce him so you have a sense of what you know, he has done. So Paolo is a Brazilian architect, researcher, and a prolific writer um, whose practice encompasses a variety of pedag pedagogical design and academic projects um, that he has featured as books and publications and installations in myriad museums, institutions, biennales um, all over the world too many to quote, but you'll hear a bit of it. Um, he is also currently teaching at the University of Brasilia, uh, at the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism, and uh, he is involved in urban research and activism in South America through the platform Autonoma, which he founded, um, uh, which is an architecture agency, in fact, right, that he funded in 2017. So uh, I just want to say that, so the relevance of, of Paolo's work in the context of these conversations that you have heard, you know, um, this past day is really paramount, uh, as he has really, and his varied outputs, you know, his project have really tackled, you know, like the space of the forest, particularly in the Amazonian region, um, bringing forward a, a, a cunning and really, in a way, provocative idea uh, that reveals a lot, to look at these natural formations as an architecture artifact and, and an archaeological space, in a way. Um, so I let you now speak and introduce you as your work, and then I'll come back and we can talk more. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for this very kind and generous introduction. Thank you, Forma Fantasma, for bringing us here. Thank you, Prada, for you know getting this conversation together. I'm going to what I want to share with you. It's a project that's called Trees, Vines, Palms, and Other Architectural Monuments. Uh, so. To begin with, I want to address the question that the ecological crisis is not only a question of environmental repair, but for most, a question of historical reparation. We are facing an ecological crisis, a climate crisis, but we are also facing a, climate, a crisis of racism, a crisis of neocolonialism, the resurgence of fascism. And to see you know, history 
and ecological damage together means that for us to heal the earth, we need to heal communities. For us to address the future, we need to look and right the wrongs of the past. For us to think about new technologies, we we'll need to address questions of colonization. We need to address questions of a type of violence that has been waged not only on Earth, but also on communities. And those are deeply structurally entangled. And of course, that one of the means by which this type of violence has been perpetrated is design. This is an image, typical image, of the military planning of the Amazon that happened in Brazil in the 60s and 70s, a military uh, government supported by the global north that was using design as a strategy to master nature, to control nature, to plan the planet. Uh, to sort of redesign, to domesticate nature. And uh, this is a kind of typical city in the forest trying to transform the forest in something productive, something economically productive. And this led to what I call ecocide by design, a massive destruction of the forest. But of course, that uh, contrary to what we often see, forests are not empty spaces. They have been cared for, they have been habited for. And in order for the government to wage this violence, to do this planning design, it has to deal with indigenous peoples. And it has caused massive displacement of indigenous groups while this plan was implemented in the Amazon. Uh, in some cases, it led to genocidal acts, to new forms of colonization that resemble very much the ways in which the North has treated the South historically. So we were called to investigate the, uh, the case of the Shavante people uh, and to provide a mapping to show how these planning schemes implemented by the military regime were related to the displacement of the Shavante people. Right? So we started to look to these modern media that were produced in the 50s and the 60s uh, and start to say, well, where do they live? What kind of inhabitation they have? Uh, uh, and we realized that these media were reporting on this campaign of dispossession, and we found this image of the village, the ancient villages of the Shavante people that have been destroyed, that have been emptied out, uh, so in order that the government to, could occupy these lands. And it's kind of interesting because one of the owners of the farm where the Shavante people used to live was Ajipe, this petroleum company by Italy. Am I right? Ajipe? Yeah. And here's the image of the village. So what we decided to do is to reconstruct, to do what we call a kind of image archaeology of those sites in order to understand uh, what they look like. Those villages didn't exist anymore. They have been destroyed or forcibly abandoned. So this was the only evidence of these types of inhabitation that exists no longer. So we did this uh, sort of 3D reconstructions of those settlements. And you can see that they have a kind of arc-shaped form, which is very typical of the urban layout of the villages. And we also look into satellite images to find evidence of those sites. And remarkably, we found many footprints that resemble the arc-shaped formations that we model through the historical photographs. And here you see some of these arc-shaped formations. They're always open towards the river. Uh, um, and we found many of them. In fact, we identify one of the most remarkable indigenous complex in the Brazilian Amazon central Brazil. And um, there are many of these footprints that somehow, you know, we read the history of those people in the earth. The earth is an archive itself. The earth is saturated with history. There is no idea that nature is something empty. And as you can see, remarkably, uh, the footprint that we identify in satellite images is uh, very similar uh, uh, with the modeling of those uh, ancient sites. And if you look to a contemporary image of uh, these places, the sites, you see that a botanic formation is present on the site of the ancient village. And that has, it has its precise sort of arc shape of the old urban layout. And in order for us to see those sites, we went with the elders of the Shavante people. And it's interesting because the elders, they have a sort of very impressive botanic 
or architectural understanding or of the landscape. And we went to visit some of those sites in order to understand what were those botanic formations. And uh, this is uh, uh, the elder uh, Policarpo Paradinae, uh, Domingos, one of the geographers that follow us, where we are mapping those villas. And I want to share this video with you for a moment. So what is remarkable in this video that we didn't translate while we were there, and you see Polycarpo really sort of identify this botanic formation as the ancient site of his ancestors, right? He can see the forest indeed as a type of old settlement. And here is the village of Bou that he's talking about in an old satellite image. And you see the sort of botanic formation that has grown uh, on the top of uh, uh, the ancient settlement. Again, you see the village. So there is a way in which um, this is an ancient village as well. We are modeling it through digital tools. There is a way in which those trees, you know, those botanic formations, those patches of forest, they are somehow the ruins of the ancient site, right? They are the vestiges of this form of inhabitation. And what does it mean to claim that the forest is a ruin of an ancient form of inhabitation, a form of inhabitation that has been in the forest since time immemorial? What, is, what if we interpret the forest not as something natural, but in fact as the product of design? So uh, we did a book with this research, and it's very important for us. We did this book to distribute among uh, the communities. And this is very important for us because it's important to be here at this event, Prada in Milano, share these ideas with you. But it's important to be on the ground with the communities, using the resources that we have, the resources that we accumulate to make justice, to make indeed environmental justice. That is to say, to mobilize design as a form of advocacy. Otherwise, we won't heal the climate crisis. Uh, and recently, uh, one of the sites, which they call the Acropoli of the Chavante, it's called the village uh, Tsorepre, has been destroyed because we have now in power a neo-fascist, neo-colonial government that is empowering people to go against indigenous communities and advance those new types of colonization. And they destroy those sites. So what we decided to do is to draw a petition so that those trees, so that those botanic formations can be recognized as architectural heritage by the Brazilian Institute of Artistic and Historical Heritage. And we went to get the signing of the elders and make this petition and uh, we recently uh, submitted a petition to IFA, that's the, 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 the Artistic and Historic Heritage of Brazil, and immediately it triggered an investigation of who has destroyed the village and who has to be responsible for the destruction of the village, which is, at the end of the end, the destruction of the forest itself. So just to conclude, uh, there's two ideas here happening. One is, of course, that this is a type of militant activist research to preserve those sites that are in danger of being destroyed. That is to say, to preserve not only those sites that are in danger to be destroyed, but also the communities that have planted the forest. And this is very important. Communities have always inhabited the forest. They are the stewardships of the forest. They are the ones who plant the forest. And we need to acknowledge that type of intelligence in creating forests if you want to address the question of the climate. But there's also another intervention happening here, which is on the very idea of design, on the very idea of architecture. Because this high in architecture has been conceived as that which could master, could control, could plan nature. But what if we understand that the forest itself is the product of a type of design? Right, that the forest is not only this natural, empty, dehumanized space, but it is the remains, indeed the very ruins, of a very sophisticated form of knowledge, a very sophisticated form of knowledge and design that is totally essential for us to address the climate crisis. That means to say, repairing the land, repairing the earth, means also repairing and restoring communities. Thank you very much.
right. Do you want to sit here? Yeah. Here? Yeah, okay. maybe. It's a bit strange, no? <laughs> Too far. Yeah. Thank you, Paolo. Um, well, there's a lot there, so let's, let's try, you know, like to extract, uh, you know, the juice, the, the pearls of wisdom. Um, so I, um, let's start from this notion that you briefly mentioned um, of speaking, you know, of architecture as a form of advocacy. Uh, and I think this is really central because, of course, we have done other works, you've just, you know, um, showed us one. And in another collaboration, in fact, with the artist Ursula Biemann, who is, in fact, going to speak later, I think, uh, today in this project called Forest Law, uh, you speak of the forest as a physical, legal, and cosmological entity, and ultimately as a constitutional space. So tell, tell us more about that. Um, with Ursula Biemann, we did a research on the Amazonian forest. Uh, this has been about 10 years ago where we were <clears throat> exploring uh, one aspect of what was then called the citizenship revolution in Ecuador that brought nature to be a bearer of rights. The nature is recognized by the Ecuadorian institution as uh, a bearing right entity. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and this was something that through our research and dialogues with indigenous uh, intellectuals, scientists, uh, shamans and so on, they say, well, you know, in our sort of political space, right, in our polis, non-humans have always been part of this polis, of this political space. And now they were somehow offering Western positive law a chance, so to say, to decolonize the very instruments by which, you know, it has enforced upon nature uh, an idea of colonization, an idea of mastering that at the end has led us here in the ecological crisis. And what is important to say about it is that when they were speaking about granting nature rights, this was the outcome of a political revolution that went against types of neoliberal, neocolonial austerity. So one always needs to understand the idea of rights as embedded in a political process. And I think that's, that's why when you claim that you know, trees should have rights and nature should be a bearing right entity, one needs to look at the history of what is the political struggle behind this as you know, one would see that, in fact, uh, the revolution for freedoms and liberty are very much grounded on a decolonial revolution, like the revolution that happened in Haiti mm -hmm. in the 18th century. So that's what I think it's meaningful for me in these types of ideas. Non-humans have to have rights, but one needs to understand what is the struggle and what is the sort of you know, cosmopolitical thinking behind it. And I think that's... Um, yeah, I don't know if I replied to you, but that's that's the way I would think about it. Yeah, it's I mean it's pointing in in, in the right direction where I, where I really would like to go in a sense that uh, you know we, in this talk you know I think uh, you know was mentioned you know of course like the IPCC reports you know and all these sorts of like technical instruments that we are equipping ourselves you know to. Uh, get data and etc. But there is something quite peculiar about actually the last, uh, you know, um, IPCC report uh, from March in 20, this, this earlier this, this year. The first, for the first time ever in the history of the existence of these documents, it mentions equity and justice as key uh, concepts, you know, key horizons, you know, uh, through which uh, and central to political decision making for enforcing you know, Earth's future. And this, what it proves is that clearly climate change um, abates more virulently on the life of you know, already uh, vulnerable people. So, um, and often those that have been object, of course, of you know, industries of extractivism, you know, like, and political abuse and et cetera. So uh, most likely from the epicenters of places like where we are sitting, you know, like today. Um, so, but going back to your you know, notion of ecocide by design, um, perhaps you can, you can mention a little bit more of other research because you have conducted a lot of projects, of course, throughout different regions in South America. And I, I really would like you to share a little, bit, a little bit more of your knowledge and experience from that. Let's go back to that notion 
what, what, because ecocide is a very important term uh, yeah. right now too. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I think, thank you very much for mentioning the IPCC report when for the first time finally, you know, one would consider that poverty and unequal wealth distribution and, you know, all topics that people have been really against uh, are in fact driving forces, as climate science says, you know, they're uh, driving environmental drivers of climate change. They're env environmental drivers of the ecological crisis we live in. And that's why I say, and that notion is something that I'm working a lot right now, that without reparation, you know, without questions of repair of these communities, we are not going to fix the earth. And the fact that this is being very much later on incorporated by the global systems of governance uh, is for me remarkable, but also symptomatic of how these types of global governments have failed in addressing a crisis that still linger on, linger on, linger on, linger on, uh, while we see that from the point of view of those folks that have been caring for the forest and fighting for it, there have been all, always you know, many different types of interesting solutions and, and innovative sort of technologies uh, uh, and ways of dealing the land that, uh, 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 that could be you know, uh, applied. Um, one being you know, people must have rights to the land and once they have rights to the land, that's one of the most effective ways for you to deal with climate change is to enforce indigenous you know, land rights. And uh, um, to go to the, uh, I think, sorry for the, you know, taking it longer because I think it was important to mention the IPCC. And um, in a way, uh, when I say ecocide by design, I, uh, ecocide, in fact, it's a term uh, that was invented in the 70s and 80s to uh, address, you know, the environmental types of warfare that have been developed by the United States and other North uh, global uh, powers, uh, specifically used against Vietnam, but that was, you know, the type of environmental thinking that happened in the 70s. And uh, um, so there is a way in which the crisis is not the outcome of lack of governance, of lack of control, of lack of, you know, this is a kind of byproduct of progress that we now humans are facing. Oh my God, what's happening? We polluted too much in the environment. No, there was a very sort of conscious design uh, uh, that has led us here and uh, this design, as environmental warfare shows, uh, have very much been driven by you know, the capitalist, uh, neocolonialist, racist war machine. And in many different ways, what we are seeing today in the types of technological fixes that are being proposed, like you know, uh, uh, Earth sort of terraforming technologies and uh, uh, these new types of geodesigns, comes also from a type of mentality that is very much uh, war-driven, very much war-driven, and, and very much in this a kind of ecocide by other means in a certain way. So I think, you know, to recuperate and to understand that uh, Western-based types of environmental thinking were very much grounded on this idea of a warlike economy and how ecocide has been perpetrated by design is fundamental for us to shift uh, not only the paradigm, but really sort of the terms in which we are discussing things now. Yeah, yeah and I think <clears throat> language is very important, mm -hmm. right, in that, in that sense. I, I think that in, uh, you know, quite also some other addresses that we are heard and of people that, of course, we commonly know that are very active in this sort of realm of, let's say, eco-politics and creative practices, they really take to... Um, put agency to you know their their work you know not purely on the representational level. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there is I mean clearly uh, this desire you know like to open up to this idea of entanglement you know of planetarity you know so this idea of of a uh, yes an epi epistemological change you know to the way that we understand essentially our presence on Earth um, as species as humans and and. Um, so I, it would be interesting, you, perhaps you can, you know, um, address that. So when we speak of what is this knowledge, you know, that, we, that we, we can drive, you know, like from other than, you know, European or Western-centric, you know, like understanding of these relationships, 
not relationship between man and nature, but also really conceptions of the web of life. Yeah. Well, that's a very. Deep I let you. I, I know, but I let you say it. <laughs> that's a very deep question, and I don't know if I can answer. What I can say is that you know, in my practice, um, I sort of acknowledge the way in which design has been used as a means to perpetrate violence and try to subvert it as a, what I call a form of advocacy. And I have the opportunity and uh, the privilege of working with very different types of indigenous folks and communities in South America, throughout South America, Ecuador, Central America, Brazil, and other places. And in contact with them, one uh, understand how there is an entire philosophy, an entire what one might call a cosmopolitics, that allows us to think the terms differently, you know, to think uh, nature and you know the variety of landscape in a completely different way, and, and understand the world and our relationships with the world in a very different way, but also very concrete, you know, very material, very very present, still alive and still fundamental. And uh, Western thought has always tried to say that, you know, those were traditional types of design or vernacular, you know, taking out the sort of innovative technological aspect of it. But what I can sort of identify in this new sort of, the forest is indeed as an epistemological, as a space of knowledge, is that we can draw a different idea of design, a design that somehow goes beyond the human, right? A design that's there, done and conceived in a much more collective, uh, multi-species way to the extent that, and what is beautiful about, you know, these botanic formations as ruins and, you know, is that very dear to me, is that you see that they are a design product, but a design product that was made by multi species, right? And they generate biodiversity, right? They generate the forest. And I think that's that's crucial. Yeah, that's crucial for us to within the to field engage. of design today, yeah. So so that's the next question, of course, the big the big hotball. Um, well so I mean, of course, there is, you know, evidently, and, and this very, you know, um, conference, you know, and the topic that was chosen is an expression of that, right? That there is clearly a, 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 an engrossing and, and, you know, thickening interest in understanding also, well, if politics failed us, uh, you know, is sort of technocratic rationalization failed us, how else do we go about it, right? And there is a whole history of environmentalism and creative practices that have done this since 50s or 60s, let's say, more um, actively. But so in your experience or in what you're doing, I mean, uh, so how do we go about this? How do we kind of change this culture of practicing design, of teaching design? Um, do you have any, you know? I think that's the crucial question. And, um, and, and I think this, 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 this gathering is really interesting that way. Uh, to think the forest not only as a resource, you know, not only something that we need to care for, obviously, uh, not only as carbon, but indeed as a space of knowledge, right? As, you know, as a ruin that's like Western thought, and we hear in Italy, you know, how, you know, we derive a whole theory and ideas of design, you know, looking to the ruins of the ancient world, how can we look to the forest and understand that by reading it, you have, uh, you learn, you know, a different type of ways of, you know, designing and conceiving and conceptualizing that is much more broader and shared and not human-centric. So I would say, maybe to conclude, that I think that the problem is not planning the planet, but planting it. And planting is a very ancient form of planning and a form of planning that's tuned, very fine-tuned with the winds, with the climate, with the insects, with the bees, you know, with all this sort of multiplicity of life that makes our world. So I think that's, you know, to learn from the forest, to learn from the bees is crucial for design thinking today. Good. Well, take the cue. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, 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 we're going to do Q&A. Wait, 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 wait. You must have questions. <laughs> you must have questions. You, what, we have just that, I know, we do have some minutes of Q&A. It's not so oh, those, tight. Good. Yeah, we did well. Very good. Uh, 
Hi, um, I'm Francesca Romana Furlini from Kudzark. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to you, Paolo, and all the other speakers. I do have a question on um, value attribution, which I think could extend also to the previous uh, speakers. So uh, we've learned today that um, trees do have a financial value through carbon offsetting. Um, and you mentioned, and I find it particularly interesting, the cultural value of trees, which is the one that, was, that is attributed by the dispossessed indigenous peoples, that, that you, people that you showed us today. So, um, and you even mentioned the recognition of historical heritage, all the activist work that you've done. So I was wondering whether um, shift in narrative or better, uh, better a shift in attribution of value or values uh, that could be attributed to people. Um, so from basically a shift from financial to cultural value. Um, which might also potentially involve um, institutions that um, look at the protection of world heritage, let's put it this way, could solve this legislative impasse of international government that we discussed earlier. Thank you, for thank, the, you. thank you very much for the question. It's also a very big one. What I could say is that the way in which global governance tries to deal with the climate crisis is putting a price on everything, right? So, you know, let's see how trees are valuable. And of course, that's a very narrow, narrow way of understanding what a tree means. Uh, and indeed, it has cultural, cosmological, technological, and many, indeed, you know, it's the best technology to capture carbon, of course. And some people know how to nurture the technology. Uh, and uh, so I agree with you. We need to attribute to different values and cultural values are really important. And uh, uh, in that way, what you just mentioned, uh, that a shifting narrative uh, is totally important, and that's the role that I see for the arts and also for design narratives, how we are going to transmit and communicate to a public at large uh, what uh, are the different ways of seeing, of sensing, of visualizing nature that are not reduced to a very narrow economist way of dealing with that. And you know, I was just remember a project that Bea did um, in uh, Portugal, which was called Visual Natures, right? Uh, and we have this idea of visual cultures and how we should understand globalization and the globe with different types of cultures and how this is important to acknowledge cultural difference. But I think we are in a political crucial moment that we need to acknowledge different natures, a multi-type of naturalism, right? That people don't agree about what nature is, that we don't agree that a tree must be put a price. Maybe it doesn't should be put a price, and we need to bring these different visions or visuals, and maybe you can speak a little bit about the project, it would be great to hear, you know, and that's how I see, you know, the role of cultural institutions as central to the climate crisis, and I guess, you know, also, Bea is on that, uh, working on the forefront, and I think uh, Ursula Biman, that's going to speak here uh, later on, uh, is also exploring uh, those ideas a lot. And indeed, I think the seminar is also very important in the sense of how we can understand the values of forests otherwise. No, I can mention something. Uh, no, so talking about this project, which is completely like something that you said, and I ripped it off and called my project Visual Nature. <laughs> but um, no, I want to mention it because, well, if you are interested, if you're here and you're you know, interested to really understand how within the culture and creative field, you know, a lot of efforts intellectually, et cetera, are done, there's a project that um, Paolo, together with other three people, together with TJ Damus, Molemo Moiloa, and Susan Shupley, um, developed for over a year. It's a project that I commissioned when I was at MAT in Lisbon um, as a kind of midterm journey, let's say, of conversations uh, that they co curated under the umbrella of this climate collective. Um, and and I, what I thought was very valuable, the program was then uh, subtitled from climate emergency to climate emergence. 
with, I think, the idea that you know, we, if we remove ourselves also from this kind of you know, catastrophism you know, that is impending whenever we talk of climate, then we are opening up spaces emotionally, mentally, intellectually to speak of climate future in a different way. And that's a space that generally is populated by creative intelligence. So this program that you guys did, I, th I, th I thought was um, essential because you guys also talked a lot about this form of intersectional environmentalism that speaks of, of how gender, race, um, you know, um, grassroots intelligence comes, in, com comes involved, so. Yeah, absolutely. We have this idea that, you know, sometimes environmentalism comes from, you know, the kind of more classical institutional framework and, um, you know, sort of very well-known green activists and also histories of, you know, the 80s and things like that. But if you look at the history of it, you know, even the history of colonialism and resistance to colonialism, they are always embedded in questions of land, of protecting mm -hmm. land. You know, the fight against, you know, racism was implied in the protections of territories, in the protections of forests. You know, even in the 60s, the civil rights movement has an entire beautiful chapter on how this entangled with questions environmental. And, you know, the resistance against Brazilian dictatorship by Chico Mendes was, you know, he was fighting for the protection of the forest at the same time that he was fighting for free speech. You know, one cannot disentangle those things, right? They are completely sort of uh, uh, in intersection. And I think that's sometimes what is missing at the debate, you know? And of course, we are happy that IPCC is now recognized, you know, you know that inequality is like an environmental Part driver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but in our, you know, following your work also, you know, it's amazing how cultural institutions are somehow at the forefront of it, you know, really pushing that type of discourse. And maybe that's the kind of answer or institutional space that we need, you know? What are the forums that we need to get together and have a conversation about those kinds of things? And, you know, it was remarkable and very sort of a learning curve to, to work with you and, and TJ and, and, and Molemo and Susan uh, on that project because the types of conversations that we could have on ideas of, you know, repairing land and repairing communities, uh, 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 yeah, they were really sort of meaningful to, for us to think forward, I think. Yeah, so I think these types of, you know, creativity and cultural production and, and these types of events, that they're fundamental. They're not, you know, a side note that let lead, you know, these things to the serious scientific folks to deal with. No, this is our problem. We need to, you know, hold with our hands and do the, or the kind of work that we need to do. Yes, I agree completely. And thank you for the commending words. But, well, as, as a, by way of a conclusion, I, I also want to just make a remark on, on something you just mentioned, which is, um, the, the conversations are important, uh, you know, within the professional field, with public facing, you know, like uh, entities. But I think that it's we. The, I think the, the the major, you know, the most drastic, you know, step we have to make is really to learn our history. And and the project that you mentioned, Visual Natures, this is really an analysis of basically of the history of environmentalism in the 20th and 20th century and how much we failed, how many missed chances there were, but also how much was achieved in alternative to the, to the major political narratives. So true, we, collectively we, you know, we act as citizens, we act as students, as, as, as artists, as creators, and etc. There's so much that comes entangled. But we have to learn that history because a lot has already happened and we can learn from it and know better where we can be headed. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you.